Hi, I wanted to discuss the topics about synapses and uh, neuron to muscle synapse connections in particular and the diseases related to that um, from the last couple of class periods. So uh, actually, first of all, um, generally speaking with synaptic communication, we've discussed a couple times now and you should um, uh, be able to think about when uh, you're not going to have to memorize the ion concentrations, but you should be able to think about them. And when we have ions at different concentrations, then that results in um, ions flowing across the membrane. Um, voltage activated channels um, open and close, allowing different ions to pass at different times. And in the presynaptic terminal in particular, when there's an action potential that arrives, voltage activated calcium channels open, then that uh, causes that calcium sticks to vesicles. The vesicles fuse with the membrane, release their neurotransmitter, the postsynaptic cell receives that signal, and then the neurotransmitter gets sucked back into the presynaptic terminal. Um, there's one exception to that, which is um, related to acetylcholine. Um, on the receiving side, before the neurotransmitter gets sucked back up, though, it causes a response. Um, with glutamate, that response is opening a sodium channel. With GABA, that response opens a chloride channel. And so that either lets in positive or negative charges, which will then either excite or inhibit the receiving cell um, and bring it closer or further away from action potentials. Uh, later on in the course, we'll talk more about metabotropic receptors. These have slower, more complicated, longer-lasting effects. Um, <clears throat> we also discussed um, the um, particulars of the connection between motor neurons and the um, uh, postsynaptic muscle cell. There, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. It binds a sodium channel um, called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and this lets sodium flow in, and there is so much acetylcholine release and so many connections between motor neurons and muscles um, in, that when the motor neuron fires an action potential, there's a huge response that is guaranteed to cause um, a postsynaptic action potential and postsynaptic muscle twitch. One thing that you should be aware of, because especially as this is going to come up when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, um, is that acetylcholine is not directly removed from the synapse. Instead, it is broken down into acetate and choline, um, which inactivates it. And then those parts, those um, two different inactive substances, are brought back into the neuron where they're put back together. The reason for this is it allows much quicker um, elimination of acetylcholine and inactivation of acetylcholine so that that muscle connection doesn't stay active too long and the muscle relaxes after the motor neuron stops firing action potentials. In looking at the um, postsynaptic response um, at a uh, healthy neuromuscular junction, um, those healthy um, responses are about 10 to 20 times as large as they need to be to get a uh, to get a postsynaptic action potential. So if we just fire have an action potential in our motor neuron, it's guaranteed to give us an action potential in the muscle. Um, and if we even if we stop action potentials in the muscle, what we can uh, what we would observe is that when the motor neuron fires an action potential, there's going to be a huge response in the muscle. We won't get an action potential because we blocked sodium channels. Um, we blocked voltage activated sodium channels. The nicotinic acetylcholine sodium channels are still working. So there's so much that comes in. Through do those that's not an action potential, but it's way more than the need, muscle needs to get to an action potential. And if we keep stimulating over and over and over again, then the size of that response gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but never small enough that the muscle doesn't twitch, um, at least not until after the muscle has completely fatigued for other reasons. One thing that we can measure, though, is look at the ratio of responses between the first and second pulse. So the first time we stimulate divide by the second time, or the second time we stimulate divide by the first time we stimulate. That ratio of response is actually going to be an indication of whether we've got changes in the presynaptic or postsynaptic cell. So in particular, um, in myasthenia gravis, um, because there are fewer postsynaptic receptors, the size of the response is smaller. But the ratio that the same sort of decrease in acetylcholine release happens because we're running out of acetylcholine just the same as we are in our healthy synapses. And as a result of running out of acetylcholine at just the same rate, the ratio of responses is exactly the same. However, if and, and so one way um, one thing to, to be aware of is that there are two things going on in the presynaptic term. One is running out of acetylcholine vesicles causing less acetylcholine release. 
The other is a little bit of a buildup of calcium. So you, the calcium that comes in sticks around for a little bit. <clears throat> if in a healthy muscle, this first fat, the running out of acetylcholine vesicles, is what dominates and what causes this decrease in the postsynaptic response. In the myosinia gravis, the presynaptic terminals unchanged. Our, um, our uh, autoimmune attack is attacking the postsynaptic receptors. And as a result, the, the changes in release, the amount of acetylcholine, the ratio of acetylcholine release, doesn't change. This is different from, however, Lambert-Eaton syndrome. In Lambert-Eaton syndrome, the presynaptic calcium channels are being affected, are being damaged. Um, and as a result, less acetylcholine is released is released with less acetylcholine release then that first response doesn't get to threshold but um, the calcium still continues to build up and we're not running out of acetylcholine because we're not running out of acetylcholine then our second response is larger and if we keep stimulating keep trying to move that motor neuron keeps firing action potentials then eventually the muscle we're watching the muscle here the muscle will fire an action potential and twitch <clears throat> also, I wanted to quickly review the sort of complicated topic of reflexes. First of all, with reflexes, the main thing to be aware of is that spindle fibers that sense the muscle's stretch, stretchness in the periphery connect in, make an excitatory connection that will activate a motor neuron and cause that motor neuron to fire and make the muscle twitch. So when the muscle stretches, then there's a quick compensation um, to contract it again. Um, although the synapse is inside the spinal cord, all of the axons are coming in from the periphery and going right back out through the periphery. So that synapse, that reflex, basically just depends on the peripheral nervous system. It turns out that it's a little bit more complicated than that because when you're just relaxing, your motor cortex is actively turning down your motor neurons, keeping them from firing. And so when you're just resting, your reflex is a little bit weaker than it should be, or rather, a little bit weaker than it would be if it weren't for your brain. And um, because that reflex is just a little bit weakened when you're just hanging out, um, there, um, uh, if that connection from your motor cortex to your motor neurons in your spinal cord is broken, or is damaged because there is um, uh, uh, um, damage to the oligodendrocytes in, in, um, uh, in uh, multiple sclerosis that prevents that inhibitory connection from working effectively, then your reflexes get stronger. So there's this constant inhibition, and if the motor cortex isn't working, or if it's distracted, or if um, its connections are not fully functional because those axons are being destroyed or partially destroyed um, and partially unmyelinated, then that is going to cause a stronger reflex because that suppression, that constant inhibition is gone. Um, when you try to move, your brain turns off the inhibition and turns on an excitatory connection, which then gets you to move um, by activating those motor neurons. Um, and in, my, in multiple sclerosis, um, that um, excitatory connection is also not completely myelinated. And so when you try to, when you so when you try to move, you don't move as much. That experiences weakness. So um, the motor cortex is doing two things. It's exciting and inhibiting the motor neurons, inhibiting them at rest, exciting them when you're ready to move. And in multiple sclerosis, both of those functions are interrupted. And so at rest, you give a bigger reflex because that, ta that constant inhibition is gone. And then when you try to move, you get a smaller response because your motor neurons, your motor neurons don't get excited. Um, <clears throat> Guillain-Barré syndrome, however, um, interferes with the peripheral myelination. And so the spindle fiber inputs don't come in quite as strong or quite as often or as not as all the action potentials get there. And then the motor neurons, if they do fire, their outputs don't come as strongly back out um, or it's not all the action potentials get to the end um, or they take longer to get there. And so with Guillain-Barré syndrome, you get a slower reflex. And that's actually another diagnostic test to distinguish between multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barré syndrome. And so, um, and actually, uh, also, um, so 
uh, this is sort of a summary of all of the symptoms of the different diseases um, that we've talked about involving um, axons and neurons and muscles. Um, so Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, uh, the axons are degenerating, so there's weakness, not all of the intentional action potentials get out to the end. Um, the incoming sensory axons are also damaged and since the signals don't come as quickly or they don't get to the brain as uh, completely and the reflexes are weakened. In multiple sclerosis, weakness and numbness are both there as well as the spontaneous action potentials that cause uh, random twitches and tingling sensations. Um, but the reflexes actually get stronger because of this removal of the constant inhibition that's normally going on to keep your muscles from uh, moving when they're not supposed to. In myasthenia gravis, um, the weakness builds up after sustained activity because just like a healthy set after running out of acetylcholine, but now we have so few receptors that we do notice the running out of acetylcholine. There's no numbness because it's just a motor synapse uh, connection. And the reflexes probably are about the same, maybe a little bit weaker depending on how severe the disease is. Lambert-Eaton, um, however, um, has weakness at first, and then as the calcium builds up in the presynaptic terminal, we finally start releasing acetylcholine. So the weakness starts at rest and gets better with, it, with continued attempts to move. There's no numbness, because Lambert-Eaton syndrome, again, is just the neuron-to-muscle connection, and the reflexes are going to be very weak or maybe even gone entirely, again, depending on how far along the disease is progressed. Um, I hope all this was helpful, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.